Hey, how you doing? Justin here. In this video, I'm going to show you how to change strings on an acoustic guitar. We're going to more or less get stuck straight into it if you've got questions like when should you be changing strings and what strings should you have and all of that sort of stuff. I'm going to put the Q&A stuff at the end of the video. We're more or less going to get stuck straight in. But there are some things that you should have before you get going. There's some optional stuff and some must have stuff. First of all, strings. You're going to need some strings. If you're not sure what strings, like I said, we'll answer that question at the end of the video. I would recommend that you have at least two sets because you do find occasionally that you break a string while putting them on. So what you don't want is take all your strings off, put them on, find that you break one in the process and then you don't have any spares and you have to wait to go to the store before you can play guitar again. So always have at least two, if not three sets around before you start changing strings. You will also need a tuner of some sort. Doesn't matter if it's an iPhone app or a clip-on tuner like this or a floor tuner, doesn't matter, but you need a tuner of some sort. Optional things that'll make your life a lot easier. Definitely a little string winder. Uh, saves loads and loads of time. Definitely recommend uh, getting yourself one of those. You want some sort of polished cloth I'd recommend. I just tend to use like your regular bathroom flannel kind of a thing. I use that for cleaning the fretboard down, which I think is a good idea while you're changing strings, but you don't have to. If you're going to uh, clean the neck, uh, you probably want some sort of uh, fretboard conditioner. I tend to use lemon oil. I've been using lemon oil for a long time, just uh, seems to work for me, but there are many different types available. Some pliers are a good idea. You're going to need it to cut the strings. The string winders I use have a, a little kind of string cutter built in on the end of them. But if you don't have that, then you're definitely going to need some pliers. And pliers are good for tweaking the end of the string as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And lastly, you may or may not need this, but a pencil. This is a strange pencil to choose, but my daughter happened to have left it in the studio. It was actually the only pencil I could find. So that's what you need. Now it's time to get stuck in. And we're going to start with a pencil. Now, it's not uncommon on an acoustic guitar for the bridge to fall out, the little white bone or plastic thing that you got on the guitar there. And if you get around the wrong way, you might end up with a little bit of a problem. Now, I don't think this one falls out that I, I remember, but a little bit of pencil on one end on the top, just so you remember which way up it goes if it falls out. Really handy little hint for you there. Uh, if, you, if you find that happens to you, it can be a bit of a, a pain. So the first thing you need to do is remove the strings. Now, again, having a string winder is super helpful at this point. I usually do this uh, job sitting down on a seat. Uh, you might want to do it on a table and get a mat. But this first thing you want to do is just loosening off all the strings before you even think about cutting them. Okay, you don't want to cut them with all of the tension on it. It's not a good idea. Um, while I'm doing that, I should also maybe mention that I often hear people talk about the dangers of pulling all the strings off at the same time. And I don't really, I've, I've been taking all of the strings off all my guitars. That tuning peg's a little stiff. Um, for my whole life and I never had a problem. I guess there are some circumstances where you might not want to do that. Uh, some bridges that fall off all the time, like on 335 type guitars or some kind of Gibson guitars where the bridge is a little bit loose, uh, they can fall off and that can be a bit of a pain if that happens. Uh, if you've got a Floyd Rose floating tremolo, that would be a little bit of a pain as well. So all I've done is just absolutely loosen the strings off. Now, the next job would be cutting the strings and I'd recommend that you cut them around the 12th fret. Uh, just give them a little nip there and you're going to have your strings off. The reason for the 12th fret is it's roughly halfway. And if you cut it roughly halfway, when you roll them all up, it goes for a nice little ball. Now, uh, taking the pins out, you don't have to worry about the order of the pins. It's not like some pins are for the thicker string and some are for the you know set strings. Okay, they're all out except for one on it. I've got them all out. You probably find most uh, winder tools, uh, if you can't get one out, a lot of winder tools have like a little uh, divot in them. This one's in the handle of this, got this little U-shaped bit where that can help you pull them out. Otherwise, you know, having your pliers, if you, if you need to, uh, is a good way to do it. Um, obviously, if you've broken a string, you need to make sure you get the ball out from inside the guitar so it doesn't rattle. Uh, so that's first step. Second step now, taking them off the headstock, um, where is that string? I was hiding. So you want to unwind it. Hopefully you've wound it on properly when you did it and you've got a decent amount of wind. So you should have to unwind each one a little bit. 
Um, just be careful here with these strings as well. You don't want to poke yourself in the eye with it. I've done it before. Uh, I generally don't worry about like wearing glasses to change strings, but I know people that do. So you've got all of those. I put the balls and the windy bits at one end. You should find they're roughly the same length. Just one little loop and then spin them around like that. And I try and remember to put them straight in the bin. Sometimes dogs and cats like to play with them or try and eat them. It's probably not going to be very good uh, for your animal if they eat the strings. So strings are off. At this point, I always clean the fretboard. Now, some people like cleaning their guitars all up at this, you know, polishing the whole thing. I give it a little wipe down around the bridge. It looks like my bridge uh, piece didn't fall out then either. I give it a little bit of a wipe down first. Give the headstock a little, like you can use polish or not. I, I, I don't tend to do a lot of guitar polishing. I like the fretboard to be nice and clean, but I'm not that worried about all of the rest. Kind of adds to a bit of the, you know, they're tools for me, I guess, anyway. But, but the oil part is a, a good one. So I always, now again, you know, there might be people who think that I'm, or say that I'm doing it the wrong way, or that I've used too much or too little of something, and I, you know, whatever. It's, everyone's a little different, doesn't make that big a difference. The oil for me is part conditioning the neck, and partly it's cleaning it, so I'm just going to give it all like a little wipe down there. And then I just go through each uh, little fret and give it a, a rub down, make sure there's not too much muck in there. Um, just because they do get a bit mucky, you know, all of the gunk off your fingers, unless you, I guess you wash your hands between every time you play guitar. Um, it might not be so mucky, but I'm not sure many people do that. Oh, it does look so much nicer with a bit of oil too. It really changes it up. Sometimes if you've got loads of muck on there, you might need to kind of scrape it off a bit. If you're going to do that, make sure you use something not too, not abrasive and scratch your guitar neck, unless you don't care about that sort of thing, which I would suggest you should. There we go. So it doesn't like, and again, if if I was doing a this for a guitar that I hadn't played for a long time, and the neck had got really dry, I might put the oil on and leave it for, you know, 10 minutes or something like that and just let it settle in, like wipe it down loosely and just leave it to settle. Um, so we're now at putting the strings on. So uh, obviously important to get the strings in the right uh, order. Diodario color code those, theirs. So they have different colors for different strings. But to be honest, you probably will be able to tell which is which. Um, looks like these are paired up anyway. I always start from the thickest string. I don't suppose it really matters that much, but the little next thing I'm going to show you does make a huge difference. So let me just explain what's going on. And it's to do with how you put the pin in. Great, I've managed to throw that right across the room. Amazing. So if you go to put the ball in and you just pop it straight in and then you put the peg in the top, what you might end up with inside is the ball sitting right at the end of the peg. There's usually a little groove in there and sometimes it sits like that in the hole. Now, if that's the case, when you start tightening the string, it can pull the uh, pin out while you're tuning it up, fly out or keep loosening itself. So what you really want is you don't want the ball sitting right at the end of the pin there. So what I'd recommend that you do is you just kink the string ever so slightly. Then when you put it in the hole and then you put the peg down on, on top, when you pull it up, the peg will be, the, the pin is more likely to be kind of up here somewhere, halfway up the pin, not pulling it up from the bottom. So really big deal, I think, is just this little kink, then pop the string in, then pop the peg in, hold the pin and pull the string. And now I can feel it's already, I can pull that pretty hard and it's not pulling the, the pin out because the ball is sitting kind of around on the side of the pin, not on the bottom of it. Okay, so that would be the first thing. Let me grab that other string. Now, I'll go through and put all of the strings at this point. So you just see I've kinked the string again. So the kinked end goes in, put the peg in, and give it a pull. There we go. Okay, next couple of strings, just unwind them, kink the string, 
peg in, there we go, and pull it through, and so on. All the rest of the strings, peg it a bit. There we go. There's two more to go. La 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 la. Okay, string is bent, pop the string in, pull it up. The thing, if you don't do the little kink, it really do, it, it's very, very common for the pegs to get pulled out as you go along, and it can get a little bit worrying because you think it's going to fly out. And the other thing that can happen, that one's not, yeah, there we go. Um, the other thing that can happen if you don't uh, kink the string and get the, the, the ball position properly. Uh, is that it can, while you're tuning it up, it'll suddenly drop all of a sudden. Uh, so this next part is the one I think most people worry the most about. So I just pop all of the strings there under the neck, just tucked it between the between my leg and the neck or whatever, just to hold them in place, but it doesn't really matter where they're going. I'm just trying to keep them out of the way for this video as well. In fact, I might just put them all down like that. Okay, so here's the string. First thing we're going to do is twist the headstock around so the, the hole is pointing straight up. Then we're going to feed the string all of the way through. Now, if you start winding at this point, you're not going to have enough slack to hold the string on. So you definitely want to pull it through. Generally speaking, at least kind of to the next peg is a good little gauge uh, that I think of. It wants to go around at least once, if not two or three times uh, around the peg before you start. So I'm just going to pull it through that much. And then what? this is a really important part of it as well. I then... While I'm just holding the string, I'm going to wrap the string around like that so it's over the top of the winding. Okay, I'm going to show that to you again. Then I'm going to press with my finger, press it down so it's touching on the guitar itself. And then I'm going to start doing a little bit of winding and making sure that the excess string, the string that's going to the bridge here is on the inside on an acoustic guitar. Okay. Now, as we're winding, the really key thing here is now that the is this excess part now is over the string that's going to the bridge. OK, and what this means is that that initial wrap I've done is over and the rest is under. And I think it kind of helps clamp the string on a little bit. And I'm just going to continue winding there. Eventually, there'll be enough. There we go. And just winding. I'm just going to check that the string's not coming out too much. Oh, there's a little click on there. That is actually the, the peg popping itself a little bit, but that's okay. There we go. Let's check that that's all good. Now, I'm not trying to get it in tune at this point, just roughly, but I am going to now trim off that excess. And I'll show you another little thing that I usually do. I don't do it every time, but I think it's generally a pretty good idea. And that is I just grab the end of the string and kink it down so it's not as pointy. So if I'm doing the rest of my uh, strings, uh, it, it's not going to stab me. It's just a, like putting a little kink in the, in the end there. Just helps me not injure myself while I'm changing strings. So let's do that whole process again now so you can see it. On, let's just get those strings out of the way. So here's the fifth string. I've made sure the hole is pointing straight up. I feed it through, pull it all of the way through. I'm going to measure it a little bit further than that um, peg now, this second one. There we go. And then pull it through. Now here's the deal again. So I'm going to pull it round to the kind of the left hand side of the peg and then over. So it's coming into the middle, then I'm holding it. And you can see here that I've kind of got my, my finger pointing it down and I'm using my middle finger to kind of keep the tension on all of the way. You don't want it just all flopping around too much. Otherwise it might get tangled up with the other strings or means that it just uh, it won't go nicely onto the peg. It'll get a little bit wobbly. So now I'm just using the string winder again. You could be doing this by hand. And again, now I've made sure that this part of the string, the string that's going to the bridge is under the bit that I'm going to cut off. Okay, so that initial wind was over. Now it's all under. And I just keep winding there now until it's kind of, you, you can't really see it from there, but now my finger is getting closer to the fretboard. Now I'm going to let it go, make sure that it's, making sure that it's positioned well in the slot there as well. 
making sure that the peg isn't popping out. That's okay. So now I'll just trim that off. Don't trim it too close to the to the end here either. I don't think it's a good idea to go too super close. Then I'll just grab the end and give it a kink. And we're good. So this is the process now. Uh, it's the same pretty much all of the way through. I'll just let you bear with me. So now we're there. I'm guessing now the amount that I'm pulling through, roughly the distance between those pegs plus a little bit more. As the strings get thinner, you can leave a little bit more and do more winds if you like. Here we go, holding it. I'm going to the outside of the guitar, into the inside, so it's going around the peg, but over the spare bit that's going to get cut off. So it's just gone over the top of that. Now I'm holding it down. I've got the, the slack there with my fingers. First finger is holding it right toward the ground. I'm turning the peg anti-clockwise and making sure that the this bit is now uh, above the part that's going to the to the bridge. Just let go of it. It's making sure it's in the slot. Giving a little bit. That'll do. I'm not trying to get it actually in tune. Just I guess for some of you, it might be a bit difficult to tell exactly. Uh, how tight to do it. You don't want to go too tight, but um, yeah, you should. These are, yeah, it's definitely nowhere near accurate to be in tune. Uh, I guess that's something that comes with a little bit of practice. Now, again, you, you can go a little bit more now for the thinner strings. If you want more winds. Now here, it's important to realize I'm going now outside to inside. Okay, and it's gone over the top of this bit. Now I'm pulling it down and now I'll do the winds, making sure that it's going in the right direction. I think it's still anti-clockwise. It looks clockwise from here because I'm now on the other side, of course. And just keep that going through. And it's got kind of close enough. Whoops. I'm just checking the pegs all good. Okay, and then trim the end. I guess that's about a centimeter or something, and then give it a little kink. Just two to go now. See, it's relatively easy to do this stuff. Uh, it's not a difficult process. It's one that definitely, like, I'm taking my time a little bit here uh, to make sure that you can see what's going on. But uh, okay, a little bit more again. So I've gone a bit beyond the. Thing, feed it through, wrap it from the outside to the inside, peg it down, holding the slack and do the winding. It gets it can get a little bit like right now it's wobbling around a little bit. I could do with a um, something holding it, which is one of those the advantage I suppose of doing it um, on a table or whatever here. Again, making sure that that slack goes above the winds now and just turning it around. I know some people like using these little tools, drills or whatever. You can get gadgets that wind the strings, but just they don't seem I don't think they save that much time as to be worth the hassle. There you go, that's roughly about right. Again, trim the end. Then give it a kink. And last one for the actual uh, putting them on bit. And then there's the more important stretching in time to go. Uh, trouble finding the hole there without my glasses on. Joys of getting old. Okay, so for this one, because it's the thinnest one, I'm kind of going considerably more. Remember I only went one peg distance there for the thicker string. Now for the thinnest string, I'm going like one and a half, almost two pegs distance. It can afford more winds. Then from the inside, sorry, from the outside, I'll say it right in a second. There we go. Holding it down. It's a little bit awkward this time, just because I'm trying to hold it in a way that is clear for you guys to see it. I'm hoping that it all stays in focus again, making sure this has gone above, which it has. And there'll be a little bit more winding here because it's the thinner strings. I've probably gone a little bit too heavy on here, really. The holding it down this whole time is also important because it helps it 
won't kind of wrap around itself. I, I generally want to see them in a nice little line underneath. Um, if it's overlapping, I think that it can actually cause the string to break sometimes because uh, the strings are obviously quite thin and quite sharp. So I'm generally looking to have a nice, a nice one. Open out a little bit. Okay, that'll do. And uh, give that a snip. And give it a kink. Strings are on. So this next bit is uh, often forgotten about. I think it's kind of the most important bit of the whole journey, really, and that's the winding on. Now, I'm going to try and put my tuner in a way that you can actually see uh, the, the note as well. In fact, I can't quite see it there. It's a C sharp. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just give it a rough tune. So I'm just going to get the notes in tune. So there's E. Should be A. You're going to see this is not going to be the first time I do this for certain. Looking for a C. There we go. Looking for D. There it is. Looking for a G. Just monitoring those pins as well. Make sure that they're not not going to pop out. Now, at this point, I feel like I should point out that you shouldn't be like keeping your eyes real close to the strings there, just in case one breaks and it kind of flicks over your eyes. Um, I'm not aware of that happening uh, to many people ever. I think I've had a couple of scares and it's, it's, I think it's hit me in the face before. Um, I think on the eye, it could be pretty painful. But... Okay, so I've just tuned all of the strings, but almost certainly the first one's out of tune already. Yeah, it's already down to a D sharp just because I had all of the strings off the guitar neck. So it kind of allowed the neck to go but bend itself back a little bit. Now I've put the tension back on. It's probably brought it forward a bit. So as I've gone through tuning all of the strings, the thickest one's gone out of tune. So you're going to tune up a few times anyway, but there's a little thing that a lot of people miss out on. And I think it's really important. It's the big difference between having your guitar continually going out of tune or not. And that is stretching in. So. I, at this point, I'll be holding all of the strings down with my fretting hand. I'll get a couple of fingers underneath the string here, and I'll use the heel of my of this hand to hold it kind of on the guitar, and then I'll stretch it. And I'll give it a good old whack. You know, I'm really, it's not excessive, but I'm, you know, each string I'm pulling at least a couple of inches off the fretboard. And I'd really, I'm not being too nice about it. I, you know, I'm not trying to break them because if you really, like if I gave it max effort, I would definitely snap those strings pretty easily. So especially on the thinner ones, I'm not going like absolutely crazy, but I want to give them a decent stretch. Normally I work my way through at least two times doing this. I might even do it again after the next tuning. See how much we drop. There we go. And now tune again. That's dropped all the way to a B, a low B from that one stretch. So you can understand, like, if you're trying to play, you just put your strings on and you're wondering why it's going out of tune. It's because they're naturally kind of stretching in a bit. That one dropped a semitone as well. Not quite a semitone, but almost. More than a semitone. Not quite a semitone, but almost. So I'm just going to give them one last little stretch through, make sure that everything is as stretched out as it's going to be because it really does make quite a difference i think oh, this guitar is going to sound lovely it's been a little while since i changed strings on actually longer than i would normally leave it yeah that's given it a good normal 
that you get hard to go out of tune a little bit when you first change strings. Unless you do the stretching in a lot, uh, I would always recommend if you've got a gig, changing strings like an hour before at least uh, to let them have time to kind of settle in, preferably do a little bit of playing on it as well before. Uh, you don't want to just change strings and go straight to a gig. That would be a, a pretty horrendous idea. But that's the process. It doesn't take that long to do it. And if I wasn't doing the talk through or whatever, and I was just a bit more doing it on my own, it really is a, a fairly short job. So let's go through and talk a bit about now the, the real common questions that people have about changing strings. The most common question I get about changing strings is how do you know when you need to change strings? Like how many weeks should a set of strings last or whatever? There isn't really a set time there. Obviously, if you break a string, you're going to need to change it. Generally, if I break one string, I change all of them. And the reason is I don't want one string to be brighter than all of the rest. So generally speaking, if one breaks, particularly if it's been a while since I've changed, I will change all of them anyway. Uh, another test that I used to use, I don't do it so much anymore, but I, I just run my fingernail underneath one of the strings. And if I get much black gunk underneath, then I'm definitely it's ready to change. Having all of that kind of finger gunk on your strings deadens the sound so they don't sound as bright. They don't vibrate as well if they've got all of that finger gunk on. So definitely uh, visually being able to see gunk on the strings or if you scrape it with your fingernail, then that's probably a sign that they need changing. You'll also see it. So if you look at strings when they've just been changed, they really glow and they're really bright and old strings tend to go like a lot. They look faded and they look dull and not shiny. Some of it's to do with the sound. So you might actually like sometimes that kind of slightly deader sound, or particularly on an acoustic guitar, it can sound better in some circumstances than a really bright sound. So sometimes I don't change strings for quite a while. Sometimes I change it more often. It depends on what I'm doing, what I'm recording. Uh, yeah, generally break one, change them all. If they got really gunky, change them. Otherwise, maybe I would say at least every six months, you probably want to be changing your strings as a, as a kind of a maximum amount of time strings are going to be decent for. I, that's kind of my best guess. If I'm doing a lot of plan and I'm doing a lot of recording, I would change my strings every couple of weeks, I guess. every two, Yeah, between every couple of weeks and at, probably at the most a month. The other question that comes up a lot is what gauge strings should you be using? And it's a real personal preference. Uh, some people prefer lighter strings because it makes it easier to play. And that's definitely true. If you use lighter gauge of strings, it's easier to press the strings down. So uh, on this guitar, I use 11s gauge. On my Mate Messiah, I use 12 gauge. Uh, I think 12 is about as heavy as I like to go and 11 is about as light, as light as I like to go. But you might find that using 10s on an acoustic guitar is uh, fine for you. So a little bit of it is experimenting. Do remember that if you change the gauge that you might need to adjust the truss rod. So there's a metal rod that goes in the neck of the guitar there. And the tension in that rod and the tension on the strings has to be equal. Otherwise, the neck bends backwards or forwards. So if you've got 12s on your guitar and then you switch to 11s, there's less tension on the string side. So the neck will pull itself back and the strings will be close to the fretboard and probably get a bit buzzy. Now, I've got a whole lesson on how to do that uh, that I filmed with my friend Charlie Chandler. So you might want to go and check out that lesson uh, if you want to know about truss rod adjustment. But that is something that you want to consider if you're changing your string gauge drastically. Another question I get asked a lot about is whether to use coated strings or not. So the idea with a coated string is they put like, you know, essentially some sort of Teflon-y material on top of the string so that all of the gunk from your fingers and your sweat doesn't corrode the string as quickly. I have found that they don't sound as bright to me when they're coated. These are coated strings. Uh, these are the, the, the brightest sounding coated strings that I've used before, and I, I quite like them. Generally, for me, it depends on how often I use the guitar. So on one of my main guitars, I would generally not use coated strings because I'm going to be changing them often enough anyway. But if I've got a guitar that I don't pull out very often, so it's mostly going to be in the case, and then I might pull it out for a particular song and then put it away again and not play it for a few months. On those guitars, I nearly always put coated strings on because I don't want to have to change the strings every time I pull out of, pull it out of its case every six months or whatever. So 
Coated strings are really good for that. They do have a lot, they give you a lot longer life out of your string. The possible downside is just this ever so slight different in t sound, in brightness, and, and how they feel under the fingers a little bit as well. They're less squeaky, which is sometimes a good thing if you're moving up and down this sort of sound that you get, like you get less of that on a coated string. Uh, so that can be a good thing. It's a personal preference. A lot of the string stuff is personal preference. So you want to try a few different things and see what, you know, what feels best to you. Well, I think we're about there. I hope this video gives you the confidence to change your own strings. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments. I really appreciate you hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and slap the like while you're at it. Hit the bell if you want to get notified when I've got a new video out. I should say as well, a special thank you to Diodario Strings who have been sorting out all my string needs for many years now. Uh, always been really supportive of me and the website. And I think honestly, genuinely, they make the best strings for me. Love the NYXL stuff just really outstanding strings. So if you haven't tried them, at least go and give them a whirl. I'll see you for plenty more lessons very soon. You all take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.